I'm Matt McCourt, and this is about Tom Roberts, a.k.a. Pig Champion Tom Pig, the main man, the guitar player, the big guy from Poison Idea and how I know him and all that stuff. Well, let's start from the beginning. I was, uh, we'll cut straight to the chase because this has got to be short. I uh, was playing in a band with Mick Zane, who later became the Malice guitar player, and uh, Brad Simpson, the Ravers drummer. And um, they sold drugs. They sold Colombian gold and they sold cocaine. Escobar co cocaine. It was really, it was great stuff, man. 1977, 78. And this guy would come over. And uh, his name was Tom. And later on, he became our roadie. I, you know, I was always friendly. We always had something to talk about, and we talked about punk rock because we were both getting into punk rock at the time. And the band I was in, we were playing Budgie and Judas Priest and Scorpions and all that stuff, but which is brand new. It was always, you know, import what they called import rock. It wasn't heavy metal yet. And uh, Tom became the uh, the roadie and uh, our pyro guy because I bought some flash pots, these fucking meatloaf pans from. From Gizmo, who was uh, the roadie for uh, Black and Blue, they were Jet then, and you'd fill the thing up, they fill the pan up with <laughs> red dot gunpowder, <laughs> and they had four of them, and they had a switch box and they had a safety plug because I'd burnt my hair with you know a tuna can flash pot, and then they would send a column of fire like ten or fifteen feet in the air, and we were playing outdoor shows all the time, so parties, and uh, Tom was the, the bomb guy, and. Uh, well, I rode to a lot of shows with him, and we listened to punk rock. Pa, uh, Tom introduced me to this band, Motorhead, and uh, their first record, and I thought, wow, this is awesome. <laughs> and later on, he turned me on to The Mentors, and uh, that's why I'm, the, the Motorhead, I'm still a fan. In fact, it's the only band I really like from the metal thing, and they were not metal at the time. It was a punk rock deal. People who were punk rockers liked Motorhead. Rockers did not like it, the unrefined sound of the bass and the singing and all that stuff. We were both into punk rock. We had this magazine called Bomp Magazine that, that actually had a, a column, how to be a r punk rocker, like the rules. And I bought a, we bought a bunch of copies so we could give it out to people to, to tell them what they can't like. You can't like Led Zeppelin and Black Sabbath. And, and there was a whole list of bands that you were not supposed to like anymore. And it, they held it stuck to it. The long goodbye, they called it dinosaur rock. So uh, Tom and my friend Eric Frey, who was uh, from my area, the guy taught me how to sing. He's known as Erie Boner in, in The Imperialist Pigs, and he's a drummer. And uh, I said, you know, you should meet, come over with me. And Eric came over, and those guys hit it off like, you know, they became great friends because they're both record collectors and both punk rock record collectors. And the most... Eric is the first guy I know who had Gigi Allen records. And, uh, I mean, Gigi would send him, you know, videotapes he made for him. It cost him like a hundred bucks. And, uh, well, those guys, they became, I actually, I told, I, Tom had all the guitars from being a drug dealer. People would trade him guitars and amps, I mean, vintage Fenders and vintage Epiphones and Rickenbackers. I said, dude, they just sit in a corner and collecting dust. They only get played when I come over, and I was coming over every day. Ah, sorry. That's uh, Dreamland talking. And, uh, yeah, that's early, but why not? So I taught him how. I said, you should play this. You should learn. It's not anybody can play it. I, look, the, the Ramones, it's, I'll show you the Ramones bar chord, two fingers. And showed him that and showed him where I made, I made notations of where the notes were and and where all the major keys changes were, and he took off on it. Pretty soon, Eric and Tom had a band called Punk Eddie and the Turncoats, and uh, they started playing around town, like at the Long Goodbye, and uh, house par started off with a lot of house parties. We played a lot of house parties, because there really was no clubs. There was the Long Goodbye, and that was it. But we weren't 21 yet. We were only 20. And uh, I remember coming up <laughs> to a house party on 75th with Punk Eddie, their first gig. And Glenn Estes, the, the bass player for, the original bass player for Poison Idea, he was bonking a chick who was bent over on the front stoop. And he said, uh, you can go around, go around the back. And I said, oh, like this? <laughs> 
And uh, I said, it looks like you're going around the back. Anyway, they played, and uh, me and Jay Reynolds from Malice and uh, Kip Doran, I forgot, Mike Tuttle, I think, was a drummer. We had a band called The Violators, and we did a mix of uh, Judas Priest and, like, Sex Pistols and stuff. So we played. Um, but they had a band called Punk Eddie and the Turncoats, and they played at the Long Goodbye. And uh, then uh, Tom kept going. He uh, said, hey, Matt, McCord. He always called me McCord. Sometimes he called me Matt when he wanted a favor. Uh, Can you help me go get my gear? The move, the pours an idea, groups gear from, it was Dean and Glenn's bass stuff and drum stuff because I had a big Cadillac, I think, at the time. And uh, I moved them from Clockwork Joe's. It was another club that opened up and uh, on Alder and took them out to Tom's house. And that's when he started with Poison Idea. About a year after that, they're going to do a record. And that's about when Wild Dogs was doing the recording at Recording Associates. And I said, dude, you should record at Recording Associates. I'll get you a deal. And so I got him a great deal from Bob Stoutenberg and co-produced the Pick Your King EP. I loaned the bass player, uh, Chris Tense by that time, uh, my Randall bass amp, which just kind of had that Lemmy sound, 240 watts. And uh, that came out. It was Pick Your King. And Mike Varney, I said, look, you know, Mike was in the nuns. He goes, the nuns? And he, Tom knew about the nuns. I said, yeah, he'll help you get this thing pressed up. So I connected those two. And Mike Varney helped Tom. I think it was the Waddell Company. Showed him where to go to get the records pressed up and how to master it. And I think they mastered it where the, the Stratville records were mastered. And this is before he did a group album. This is still during the U.S. Metal Series. And uh, that out, that 45, the EP came out, and uh, boom, they were off. And uh, it's like, you know, I've always kept, I was always friends with Tom. It got a little weird after they started playing around town and started to attract a certain group of people who uh, claimed ownership. They still do today. I'm sure I'm going to get a lot of hate mail because I say that I knew Tom in 1977, and, well, that kind of discredits them, I guess. But... Uh, Hey, Tom was always a great friend of mine. He'd come over with his girlfriend, who was a nurse at the time, to come over to my house and hang out. And his girlfriend and my mom would talk all the time. We'd drink a case of Lowenbrow and, and uh, jam in the basement and whatever. And, uh, oh, yeah, that was time. Okay. Well, she left because he was getting too punk rock, and um, he figured he was going to kill himself later, which happened later on. Um <laughs> Tom and I got tickets to the Ramones, which was at the Earth Tavern. And it, they never said it was an over-21 show when they sold the tickets. I think we had to go to Myron Frank to, to buy the tickets and or everybody's music. And so we bought the tickets, and uh, we got to the show. We got there early. We were the first pre- people in line, you know, like at 4 in the afternoon. We already saw the Ramones at the Paramount. And uh, so we thought, wow, this is going to be an intimate club show. And... Uh, they open the doors and they say, your ID? And we should give them our ID. And they said, well, you're not old enough. It's like, what the, f- what do you mean we're not old enough? We, we bought the tickets. Well, this is an over 21 show. It never said that. <laughs> so we get turned away, go buy a case of and Brown, because, you know, Tom was a high roller with a drug money. And he was filthy rich, but you'd never know it by the way he dressed. And when we got back to my house, Hey, McCord, let's call a bomb threat in. So we called a bomb threat into the Earth Tavern and said that there's an explosive underneath the stage. Today, you'd, you'd have the FBI at your house like in five seconds. <laughs> but, you know, this was the 70s, so, or maybe, yes, the 80s, maybe 1980, 79, 80. And, uh, well, <laughs> Tom and Eric made good friends, and then they had a band called the Imperialist Pigs, which I recorded. I'm credited as producing their record, which I just recorded, I think, uh, on a four-track from the driveway. And the mics went into the ca- the house. It was the summertime. And uh, then uh, what happened? Well, they joined Poison Idea. And uh, I said, I was playing with Mayhem. And I said, you know, uh, or I was friends with Steve Hanford. I was friends with Steve Hanford from when he was 11. And he, they bought the him and Steve Nims bought the first Wild Dogs T-shirts in 1982, and uh, at outside of Music Millennium, hi Terry Currier, and uh, 
So I said, Steve, I think you and Tom would really get on. And so I took him over, and uh, they became friends. And not long after that, the entire band Mayhem joined Poison Idea. And then later on, Eric Olson, I think, had had enough. And Kevin Sanders from Gargoyle, who's my pal, and he joined Poison Idea, which I thought, well, that's weird, because Kevin was totally... The most unpunk guy I knew, but it turns out he really was. <laughs> Kevin is a great guy. Kevin Sanders, hi buddy, how you doing? Hope you hope you <laughs> hope you're <laughs> not bashing in <laughs> the skulls of uh, <laughs> shoplifters at Ace Hardware. <laughs> um, I've done a lot of work for Kevin Sanders, like for uh, art for his CD covers. But uh, let's see. Um, the last uh, I, I saw Tom, I saw I was shooting Motorhead in 1998, and I saw 1999, 1988. What the hell's the difference? Um, and I went outside and I saw this guy walking by, and I go, "Wow, that's Tom!" And I ran out to the gate at Starry Night, the uh, Roseland, and I said, "Hey, man, Tom." He goes, "Hey, Matt." I go, I'm interviewing Lemmy. Do you want to come in and meet him? Come on in. So I, I knew the code for the gate and pressed the code. They opened it up and came back in. And the guys from Hatebreed were there. And I said, do you, you ever heard of Poison Idea? And they go, Poison Idea? Oh, my God. And I go, well, this is Tom Pig, Tom Roberts. He's been a friend of mine since, you know, wow, since like 77. And they got down on their knees and did the I'm Not Worthy. And it's like, wow, they did that for me, but they're doing it like double for you. I introduced him to Lemmy and... I said, the reason I like your band is because of this guy. <laughs> and he said, he said something funny. Lemmy was just a funny guy, man. He, he was just great. And uh, in fact, later on, I was downstairs and Shane from Monkey Fur, everybody's asking for autographs. And I, he said, hey, you should get, he noticed my past. He said, you should have Lemmy sign it. And I said, I don't want to bother him. He's got so many other people talking to him. And I said, I, I can't, you know, I've got the memories from all he told me that day and to that day you know, the earlier. And uh, I didn't know that Lemmy is right behind me. He grabbed me and gave me this huge hug and said, you're all right, man. And he, gave, he takes the pass that I had laminated myself and signs the thing. And gives me another squeeze and said, you know, you're okay. <laughs> Even though I don't have hair, it's funny. That was a joke from earlier on when we were interviewing. He said something about hair, and I said, "Well, you don't have anything to worry about. You don't have to worry about it falling out. It's already gone. <laughs> you beat it." <laughs> yeah. Um. So let's see. The next time I saw Tom, it was uh, I was. Oh yeah, that's right. I was. I was eating fish and chips at Henry Beasley's in 1995, and I was going to go to to school at PCC. And uh, I live on the other side of town. And I, this guy walked by with a Jimi Hendrix book. And I said, hey, what book is that? And he goes, hey, are you M Matt? And I go, yeah, Matt McCord. And he goes, oh, Fat Matt. And I go, yeah, that's me. Oh, I'm Walter X. And he owned Portland Underground. And uh, it turns out that he lived with Tom. And uh, he, not, he lived pretty close to my house. And I, he asked me for a ride home. So I gave him a ride home and went in and saw Tom and he lived on Barber Boulevard, which is now kind of this swanky place, which at the time was not very swanky, but it was uh, on Southwest. And um, uh, <laughs> he had sold all the, the gear by then, I guess. But uh, the OD and the, the, the paramedics couldn't get him out the door because he was so wide, so they took him out the window. <laughs> uh, later on, the key, Tom kept calling me to take him over to Vancouver to sell his a record collection for heroin while they were waiting for a $300,000 settlement for a song that Pantera had covered on the Crow soundtrack. And so uh, I said, ah, no. He goes, well, I'll get you high. It's like, that, nah, that's okay. Yeah. By that time, I'd already, you know, been in trouble with the law. And uh, I don't need any more trouble. Once you, once you have been in the system, it uh, sucks. It kind of sours your whole opinion on uh, yeah, your uh, criminal. Either it does or it doesn't, and uh, I didn't want to repeat it. So anyway, um, I learned video, and then I was shooting these bands, and I was working for all these different record companies, and Poison Idea was on a bill with Cradle of Filth, 
around 1999, 2000, something like that. And uh, so I shot Poison Idea. And uh, let's take a look at some footage. This is Jerry A. blowing fire. Now, Jerry A. and Tom would come into my, uh, my mom worked at a restaurant called Poncho's Mexican Restaurant in Hillsdale. And they would come in and order this huge, I mean, tons of food, my mom said. But they'd leave a mountain of, of bills as a tip. And uh, people say, you know those guys? You know, well, yeah, that's Matt's friends. It's, well, it's my friends. It's Tom. And uh, people <laughs> would see this mountain of money on the table, plus pay the bill. And uh, <laughs> it blew their mind. She still talks about that. That's pretty cool. And, uh, and, man, I miss Poncho's restaurant. I miss two restaurants. Speaking of Mexican restaurants, Tom lived across the street from Casa de Rios. So I'd go to Casa de Rios with my wife and then stop over and say hi And uh, on, Divi- on Hawthorne. Wow, man, I miss Casa de Rios. Are you in Portland? My mouth is watering thinking about that salsa. The next time I heard about Tom, Tom was dead. And it was... A shock, but on the other hand, it really wasn't much of a shock. You know, he'd been working at that for quite a while. When I met Tom Roberts, he was about 160 pounds, and he wasn't a big guy. It was after his girlfriend left and the bunk rock kicked in in the old English. Oh, yeah, that house. (laughs) I was at that house on 148th and Burnside, and I decided I better go home while I can still see double instead of triple, and uh, drove home. And as I was driving home, that plane crashed on 160th and Burnside, <laughs> the jet. I mean, a few miles, a few blocks up the street. And uh, that's crazy. <laughs> I got home and I tried to call him. I was like, oh, yeah. That was back in the days when there was no cell phone. So uh, I guess I can't call him. The electricity is out. <laughs> Oops, I just missed the good stuff. So uh, I'm probably good I left because it was, you know, a 20-minute drive all the way to the west side from Gresham. And uh, let's see, anything else? Uh, no, did the Ramones, and, well, there's a lot of stuff I just won't tell you now, but trust me, we had some history. And uh, I'm probably going to get some hate mail for this because I knew Tom before everybody else did, and uh, they claim Poison Idea as their own, and it's valid. Yeah, they made the band what they were. So Tom, take champion, Tom Roberts, the Poison Idea man. He uh, is a legend, and uh, you can see more of it in the Poison Idea movie made by Mike Lastra, and I think it's Smegma Films. And uh, we're going to put some links up in there for you to see it, and uh, I want to thank you for watching. And uh, I miss Tom. He was a great guy and a smart man, and I learned a lot about a lot of things from him. And uh, he was a musical knowledge guy you know it's like before the internet he was like the musical internet database in a brain and uh well i'll see you later i'm matt mccourt this is the interview with u.s metal tv